on this week's Vaticano. Start off the new year with a glance at what lies ahead. A Vatican specialist discloses 2016. The Jubilee of Mercy explained with all its initiatives and how to live it fully. And an artist's conversion becomes evident in his paintings. All this plus the epiphany of the Lord explained. This and more now on Vaticano. Two thousand and fifteen and some major moments now behind Pope Francis. Five international trips, including to the Philippines at the beginning of the year, and his participation in the World Meeting of Families in the U.S. in September. Back in the Vatican, October's Synod of Bishops on the Family, and the opening of the Holy Door in December. 2016, and some major moments ahead for him. With the opening of the Holy Year, the main guiding event is already underway. The Jubilee is really the main part of the Pope's message, uh, the mission of mercy. Uh, ever since he was elected, he's been talking about God's mercy, God's loving mercy. He says, God doesn't get tired of forgiving us. We get tired of asking God's forgiveness. So there will be some big events here. There will be uh, Jubilee of the people in prison, things like that. Padre Pio will be brought up here for the Padre Pio prayer groups. That's going to be a big event. But it's really not a Jubilee of big events. It's a Jubilee of, of small gestures. Everybody can live the Jubilee in their own diocese, go through the door, go to confession and learn, start living uh, the corporal spiritual works of mercy, things like visiting the sick and pardoning people's offenses. Everybody can do that everywhere. One of the largest and most anticipated canonizations of 2015 was that of Junipero Serra, missionary of California and important Franciscan of the 18th century. With the year of mercy, one of the most important personalities of the 20th century might be up for canonization in 2016, a woman known for her charitable works and care for the poorest of the poor, Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Let's just say there's been a whole lot of talk about Mother Teresa uh, until we see the final thing and a date set off. I don't think that's, that's for us to talk about. However, I don't think anyone would be surprised either if Mother Teresa became a saint. Right in the middle of the year is one of the most important events that will draw thousands of young people, World Youth Day. The destination for the largest Catholic youth party in 2016 is Krakow, Poland. After the 2011 event in Madrid, Spain, the following was scheduled for 2013 in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Over three million people attended that event and an enormous turnout will also be expected for Poland this year. I expect, uh, once again, Pope Francis to sort of wow the young people. You know, Pope Francis is popular among all age groups. He's popular among all religions, but obviously uh, he really strikes a chord with young people. There, there's no doubt about that. And I think that's, that's key, obviously, for the future of the church. He's, he's obviously very enthusiastic uh, about World Youth Day. It's interesting this time because, you know, the church is universal. We saw uh, World Youth Day and how great it was in Brazil. Now we get a chance of sort of old Catholic Europe, you know, and, and, and to see how it is there. But I expect that uh, Europe will come out in a big way for the Pope. Poland, the Philippines, Brazil, nations with a majority Catholic population are always joyful destinations for the popes. Mexico will be the next big visit for Pope Francis. Benedict XVI was there in 2012 for three days. Before him, John Paul II went in the 1980s. Now, Francis is going in February. It'll be interesting to do the comparison. If you look back at John Paul II, one of the first trips he made was to Mexico. Uh, I think it was the first time uh, we saw just that massive, massive outpouring of people. You know, the first big uh, public mass for John Paul. Uh, we saw it again. He, he returned to Mexico several times. Benedict did as well. There's an incredible popular piety there uh, in that country. And that's a popular piety that really strikes a chord with Pope Francis. So it, it's going to be interesting. And in, in a way, that's going to be a World Youth Day. Obviously, there, there are people of all ages in Mexico, but it's still a very young country. And you're going to see you're going to see young people out in a big way. Pope Francis said that he's going in particular to visit Our Lady of Guadalupe, the patroness of the Americas. On this trip, as well as in Rome and other events, Pope Francis emphasizes the theme of social justice, speaking out against narco-traffic and organized crime, and in favor of the poorest and the marginalized. But it's more than that. He wants both a deep rooting in prayer and spirituality, as well as a putting that faith into practice. I think what the Pope is trying to do is saying, uh, if you are a believer, 
you have to do something here. You can't stand by and, and watch. And that's sort of where um, I think on one hand, Pope Francis makes us all feel good because God loves you and God forgives you. And on the other hand, he doesn't make us feel bad, but he, he bothers our conscience a little bit. Say, hey, you may have it all good and you think you're fine and, and all good, but what are you doing? What are you doing about these problems in the world? And you can't say, hey, I believe and I love God, but ah, well, don't, don't worry about that stuff too much. The Pope will also remain busy at home in the Vatican, especially in the field of communications. Some change is expected. Journalists love news about journalists, so that's why we keep hearing talks about, about okay, what's going to happen, and uh, I actually think that, that um, often this is journalists talking without great sources, okay, on some of these things, but what I do think is safe to say is, is uh, after a lot of study, you will see in the new years a, a lot of moves be made. It's, it's no secret that obviously there also has to be consolidation in, in Vatican communications. We have sort of a silo system right now as it stands, and I think you'll see a start of that in, in 2016. And these are just some of the elements that are to be expected during this coming year for Pope Francis and the Church. Mary, the mother of God, mother of the church, and mediatrix of salvation. Christmas and the Epiphany would not have been possible were it not for a humble woman and her yes to God's will. Pope Francis often shows his Marian devotion and continues the traditions established by his predecessors. He goes out of his way to visit Marian shrines during his trips abroad, but he also actually begins and ends each of his trips with a visit to the largest Marian basilica in Rome, St. Mary Major. When you visit a Marian shrine, it's always like coming home. It's always like Christmas when your mother uh, stands in the door and waiting for you. Visiting a Marian shrine is exactly that, coming home, feeling like family, being at your mother's house. One of the emblematic gestures in every Holy Mass is his incensing of the Statue of Mary. Being Catholic means being Marian. And of course the Pope is Catholic, so he has to be Marian. That's normal and that should be normal for all of us. In particular, he comes from Argentina, from a Latin American country, and people there are much more hearty than we are. And uh, that's why they love the mother of uh, Jesus and they know Mary is their mother. The family ties speaking about natural life, are much stronger in Latin America than in our countries. And also the supernatural ties in the family, that is the church, are much stronger than in our countries. And so it's absolutely normal for a Latin American, for a Catholic, to be uh, devoted to Our Lady. Mary is the intercessor for all faithful before the throne of God. She is in fact the mother that unites all of those who share her devotion into one family and makes us brothers and sisters. Everyone during Holy Mass uh, receives incense. That means that we are a people of kings and priests. We have importance, we are loved and above all Mary as mother of the church. So, she deserves to be honored and incensed by the Pope and by us if we wish to do so. Mary also takes a very special place during the Holy Year of Mercy. After all, she is the Mother of Mercy. Praying to Our Lady is important because that means being part of a big family. We Catholics believe that we are not alone. We do not share the Protestant idea that we are totally alone in front of God, no. We have many friends, brothers and sisters who help us to find God. And we have Mary, our mother, who intercedes for us. And uh, that's not a longer way, that's not a bigger distance to God. It, on the contrary, it creates community. We, we are family. And so that's why it, it is important to have a devotion for Our Lady, to ask her intercession and to be guided by her. Mary will certainly be in the center of attention when the Pope goes to visit Mexico in February to one of the most famous shrines in the world, Our Lady of Guadalupe.
The new year has begun. It's a special year, coinciding almost perfectly with the extraordinary Holy Year of Mercy. Just before Christmas, on December the 8th, Pope Francis officially initiated the Holy Year of Mercy in Rome with the opening of the Holy Door of St. Peter's Basilica. In fact, the first Holy Door he opened already a week prior to that was during his trip to Africa in conflict-ridden Bangui in the Central African Republic. Opening the Holy Door in this cathedral in the Central African Republic where there's been so much violence and so much war is such a great tribute and a testimony to the need for greater mercy. And that when mercy is shown, there can be reconciliation, there can be peace, there can be forgiveness. From this first holy gate, holy doors in dioceses worldwide have opened as a visible reminder of God's mercy and a source of grace. The whole church is involved in this truly extraordinary event. What had happened over the summer was that Archbishop Fisichella had written a letter to every bishop in the world. And along with that letter was sent a, a booklet, maybe 30 pages in the different languages, that really outlined everything about the Jubilee for the bishop. And then Archbishop Fisichella has also asked every bishop to assign one particular person from the bishop's staff to be the contact person for this pontifical council so that we can send information directly to that contact and that contact can send us information about what's going on within that particular diocese. For what we'd like to do and we are doing on our website is sharing the good news of how the Jubilee of Mercy is being celebrated all around the world. The Holy Door is a pilgrimage destination for the extraordinary celebrations, but if you're coming to Rome, don't forget to register. On the Jubilee website, that's our website, okay. yeah. And so what'll happen is when people register or a group registers, they will get a ticket with a time and a number on it that they will go and present when they're gonna begin the pilgrimage through the Holy Door. Because again, there's gonna be so many people that'll wanna get through the Holy Door, we just wanna make sure that it's really prayerful. It's a spiritual journey of conversion that people are, are making. And so it'll be reserved and it'll be, you know, given enough time. People will be given enough time. For security reasons, pilgrims who don't register will actually be unable to pass the threshold. Priests administering the sacraments are vital and central for passing on mercy, especially through confession. So the church will not just sit still and wait for people to come out to her, but she will send out emissaries of mercy. The missionaries of mercy are those priests that will be sent forth by the Holy Father on Ash Wednesday um, all around the world. And they are given by the Holy Father the faculties to, reserve, uh, to forgive those sins reserved to the Holy See. And really to be a visible, a visible a uh, sign of the importance of the sacrament of reconciliation in our lives of faith because again the Holy Father wants the Jubilee of Mercy to be an opportunity to place the sacrament of God's mercy which is the sacrament of penance and reconciliation into the central pastoral life of the church. The Holy Year this time takes root in the individual diocese and not just in Rome. Every bishop will be implementing the initiatives himself. Archbishop Samuel Aquila from Denver is implementing the Year of Mercy in his own diocese and has not one but multiple holy doors. In the Archdiocese of Denver, uh, being that we're 41,000 square miles uh, and from one end of the diocese to the other takes over eight hours to drive, um, we have five different churches that uh, have been designated as places for um, going through the Holy Year doors. And uh, my hope is that as people enter into and prayerfully reflect upon the mercy of God, that they will truly discover the tenderness and the love of the Father. My deepest hunger for people is that they really come to encounter Jesus Christ. I mean, I uh, emphasize that in my preaching. I invite them, I conjole them, I uh, teach them the importance of being in a personal relationship with each person of the Trinity. The Archbishop emphasized that our times have seen more Jubilee years than in the past and highlights the reason for it. 
The importance about the Jubilee is that a Jubilee year is really highlighted within the church. Um, it, it's a time of, that is specially set aside to encounter the mercy of God and to receive that mercy and to open one's heart to that mercy and to that love of God. I, I think that our culture and world has really strayed so far from God and um, when one sees how, for example, anti-Christian the United States has become and just 20 years ago it was still considered a uh, Christian nation, um, it's unfortunate and, and it's truly sad and it challenges all of us uh, to really look at how do we proclaim Christ and how do we invite others to, in Christ, to encounter Christ and do we ourselves really believe that he is the savior of the world and that he alone is the savior of the world. Multiple initiatives are springing forth in the church around the globe making the mercy of the Father more tangible for believers and all people of goodwill during this year. Here in the beautiful and itself historic and artistic Chiostro del Bramante Museum in Rome, James Tissot's paintings are on display with the selected works for the first time in Italy. But there is much more to discover than the surface of style and fashion. It's a perfect merger between Tissot's French mind and his English brush. He was a friend of the Impressionists, but never really became an Impressionist himself. He had a great success even during his lifetime and enjoyed a very deep and rooted Catholic upbringing which shapes his whole life. And at the end of his life he experienced a new conversion towards the Catholic values. He was a specialist in the representation of human types. He had a great capacity of psychological introspection and it was possible for him to depict, through painting, a character. Tisset is the artist who shows, through the eyes of mostly women, their interiority, their psychology, their capacity always related to the masculine universe. Therefore, he plays with a double tension of fascination, seduction and desire of men for women. It's difficult to perceive through his works, but Tissot's life was quite turbulent. One of the main central experiences for him was the encounter with Kathleen Newton. She was an Irish divorcee with whom he fell in love, but as a divorcee and already mother, it was somewhat a scandalous figure. As a consequence, in the Victorian England he was forced to stay away from the social nexus since he was criticized strongly for his choice in her. It was the years of his relationship with her that he lived a little separate from society and completely dedicated to her and her children. But his fiancée died prematurely and that plunged him into a deep crisis and made him return to Paris, which led him to journey to Palestine with intention to begin depicting religious scenes within his crisis. The series, his acclaimed works on the prodigal son, came after her death. In the prodigal son, he represents himself placed in his own times and not in the biblical times, obviously, that renders its comprehension immediate. The first painting is the departure, that is the old father that gives his son the bag with money. At his shoulder you can see the brother and the cousin who bears the resemblance of Kathleen, who witnesses with sadness the departure of her sibling. He also uses painting to insert people that are dear to him. Then the second painting is the moment of loss, the moment of wasting the money. It is within a setting of a Japanese culture that he loved a lot, the sensations and the world of Japan. Then the next painting in the cycle of the prodigal son is the return, when the son embraces the father again in a scene with lots of emotion and pathos. The father takes him back in, after the son has arrived on a ship with plenty of swine on it, which recalls obviously that the wasting of the money has brought the son into a situation of extreme poverty. And at the end, 
the killing of the fat calf on the river. It is still set in an ambience normal of the life of the artist. Here we also see the brother return to see why a feast is going on and that gesture of great mercy from the father, in perfect adherence to the gospel story. In the prodigal son, Tissot saw himself, a person who passed through a difficult time to come back to his life of faith. Three men, Castor, Melchor and Balthazar, form part of every nativity scene. But who are they and where have they come from? They are central to the Feast of the Epiphany, celebrated on the 6th of January. The, the word Epiphany comes from Greek, and phanos is to appear, and epiphanos is like to appear on the outside. And there's also a long tradition of calling the Epiphany Theophany, because in fact it is a Theophany or Theophany, which is a manifestation of God. And it's a manifestation of God to all peoples, to all nations, because it's baby Jesus who appears to the three wise men, to the three magi, who represent all nations. The three wise men sought to find a king that was born and in their search had guidance from above. And they're driven by the star, they're led by the star. And these are men of culture and they're men of, of study, of science, and they're also men of some political influence and power, so of temporal power. And they represent all peoples because back at the time of the birth of our Lord, there was, there was really Europe, there was Asia, and there was Africa. And so the three kings, the three magi, they represent, the three wise men, they represent Europe, Asia, and Africa. Therefore, too, they're often depicted as being more Caucasian or white-complected, and one looking more like uh, an Asian and one looking more like an African, to represent this multiplicity of all people. Of course, America hadn't been discovered yet, and yet they are meant to represent all nations. They came from all nations, but were not Jews. In fact, they could be considered pagans. Yet they found the truth that is Jesus Christ. Yes, personally, as a philosopher, of course, I'm, I'm convinced, persuaded that through human wisdom, natural wisdom, we can come to God, we can discover God, we can discover that there must be a creator, that we can see in creation the beauty and the wisdom of God's design. And through this understanding, we can come to, to understand that someone all-powerful and someone good, someone perfect, someone omniscient, someone eternal must be behind this. So we can imagine that the three wise men were seeking, they were definitely seekers on a quest, and they were looking for the one true God. But not only are these three kings emblematic, it's also what they bring with them. Gifts for the newborn Savior. Gifts that carry a special message and symbolism. So the, the three wise men, they came with gifts because they knew that they were going to the birth of an important person. And they knew that this important person also represents God as somehow a deity. Perhaps they didn't understand quite at the beginning that they were coming to see God made man, the incarnate word. But of course we know this as Christians, that God made man is in baby Jesus. So they bring the three gifts, each one representing each of the three wise men, the magi. They bring gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and myrrh have been interpreted by the tradition throughout centuries as representing different features of Jesus' mission. For instance, it represents that he is king, that he is God, and that the prophetic proclamation that he is going to die for our sins. So the gold represents his, uh, his, him as king. The frankincense, which is used in incense, represents that he is God, that he's due veneration, reverence, praise. And the myrrh was uh, used as an ointment, a fragrant ointment for pre preparing the bodies for burial. After the Epiphany, another feast day comes up on the liturgical calendar, Christ's baptism, celebrated the first Sunday that follows. Hello, I'm Father Mark Hadu, director of the Patrons of the Arts of the Vatican Museums here in the Vatican Painting Gallery and from a beautiful painting of the visit of the Magi. Raffaellino de Cole was from Tuscany, painted this painting on wood in 1550. It's an amazing painting because of all of the movement of the people going around the baby Jesus. You can see the three wise men from their entourage coming to Jesus laying at his feet their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And in the center is the baby Jesus with his hand blessing 
one of the gifts right below his hand. And the question is, what is he blessing? Is it the gift? Is it the people bringing the gifts? It would seem because one of the girls seems to be blessing herself. Or is he blessing everyone who's coming to him? Maybe even blessing you and I. Another interesting detail is in the very back, you see the trumpeters announcing the coming. Who are they announcing? Is it the entourage that's coming from the east and the west, coming around to see Jesus? Are they announcing Jesus? Or are they calling our attention to come and adore as the kings are and offer our own gifts? That's the beautiful thing about art. It gives us a chance to meditate on the mystery. So I invite you today, bring your gift to Jesus. Place it at his feet. Spend a few moments in adoration of the mystery of Jesus who becomes man for you today.